Hello, everyone, and welcome to No Pants Theater Company's reading of work of art by Naomi Frank. I don't know where everybody is right now. I'm going to assume that you're all over the world and that you have a drink in your hand, that you got a bowl of popcorn in front of you or whatever you want. You can open those candies at any time. You can do anything you want. You're in your own home. So please make yourself comfortable, have fun. For those of you new to No Pants Theater Company, pants, as always, are optional. Your choice. There's no judgments here. My name is Jason Weiss. I'm the artistic director and founder of No Pants Theater Company. We founded this theater company as a direct result of the pandemic that faces us right now. And the idea is to bring free entertainment, free theater to people around the world. We do not charge. We do not accept donations. This is all the goodness of our hearts to put a little bit of love into your hearts. So unlike regular theater, you can do whatever you want to do. You can get up and go to the bathroom and you can hit pause. And then when you come back, you can unpause it. You can take us into your kitchen with you and make dinner. You can homeschool your children while you're doing this, or you can just sit down, relax and enjoy it. So without any further ado, I would like to bring you the original screenplay by Naomi Frank, Work of Art. Work of Art. Written by Naomi Frank. Interior, Dylan's apartment, daytime. A one bedroom apartment in Los Angeles. It's April. There's the sound of rain outside. There's some furnishings and an impressive amount of clutter. More books than bookshelves, more clothes than closets, etc. The minimal design scheme has been stretched just beyond the breaking point and the effect is somewhat claustrophobic. The bedroom's about half the size of the living room, separated by a door. A queen-size bed dominates the room, which also contains a desk and a closet. We see Maddie, 27, dressed in a little, as little clothing as possible, sitting on the bed with her portfolio open beside her. She types on a laptop, pausing periodically to reference her photographs. She is tense and clearly frustrated. The doorbell rings. Maddie rises up to answer it. Cut to the front door. Maddie opens the door to reveal Jackson, 27, extremely wet from the rain. Jackson carries his guitar case and an ancient duffel bag. Maddie's expression changes immediately to shock, anger, and bewilderment. There's a long silence as Jackson waits for Maddie to say something. Hi. Can I come in? You're dripping. Oh God, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I just here. Let me. Let me. Um. Sorry. Can Can I put these somewhere? Sorry. Maddie silently takes the wet things. She hangs them on a hook on the other side of the door. Jackson sets his guitar down, leaning it against the wall. Can I, uh? Can I sit down? So, what are you doing here, Jackson? I, uh, you weren't expecting me? No. Because I called like a, a week ago. Did you call my cell phone? Uh, yeah. I have a new number now. Oh. Oh, I, I guess I should have figured yeah. Would you like a towel? Yes, please, please. <laughs> Maddie walks into the bedroom and retrieves a towel from the closet. Jackson looks around the room, uncomfortable. Maddie returns and hands him a towel. He attempts to dry his hair and person. So, uh, what's going on? I was just, uh, you know, I was in the area. In the area. For a for a for a job for a, a gig. What's the venue? Um, I uh, can't really say yet. It, oh. it, I mean, I'm not supposed to. You know, it's a uh, it's a big one. Right, right. So, are you going to take it? Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. I mean. Of course, I just, uh, I just want to make sure it's going to be artistic fulfilling, I guess, because that's what's important, of course. Of course. So 
So, how things with you? You're fine, I guess. So, are you still, you know, taking photos and stuff? How's uh, how, how's that going? It's going. I'd love to see what. You're doing. Sure. I <laughs> uh, like your new place. Oh, it's not mine. It's it's Dylan's, uh, which reminds me. Dylan. Wait, how did you even get this address? I. I mean, you show up on the other side of the country. Or. And you're not on tour. I mean, do you really think I'm that much of? How do you know? I think you should leave. I just got here. I know the band broke up. I saw it on Facebook. Oh, I... So you what, like stalked me? What? No. I mean, what were you expecting exactly? I, I got evicted. <laughs> so no one in the entire city of New York owns a fucking couch? Or I mean, doesn't your sister live here? No, I know, I know. You must think I'm like incredibly stupid or just... Okay, can I explain? No. No, you know, I don't even care. This is just, I mean, this is just so fucking perfect. Only you, Jackson. This is so not going how I pictured it. Well, I'm deeply fucking sorry about that. Yeah, I guess I thought I surprised you. Okay, so you come in all grand gesture romantic guy and just expect me to... Well, I thought I could apologize. Really? No. No, okay, maybe like six months ago, but... It's too late? No, I just... Like I said, I don't even care anymore. Well, you still care a little bit, right? No. Or you wouldn't be upset. You couldn't have picked any other day? Is something going on? Oh, wait. I forgot. Jackson takes some wilted cut flowers out of his duffel. Did you have a bad day? I don't want to talk about it. I quit. Oh. Can you maybe not smoke inside? Um, sure. Sorry. So, why'd you get evicted? <sighs> it happens when you stop paying the rent. Which happens when you, uh, have no money to pay it. Well, how'd you afford your plane ticket then? Credit cards. So, are you, like, actually broke or just, like, Annie Leibovitz broke? If you couldn't get a job or something? It's not that simple. I mean, do you have a job? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact. Because if I recall correctly, you were in my position not too long ago and I didn't say anything. Oh, you said plenty. Well, it's different, okay? Whose place is this again? Dylan's. You still haven't told me how you found me. I asked Alex. Oh, wait, she knew you were coming? No, I I told her. I, I was going to write to you. You know, pass things up. And you couldn't send an email? You changed it. Alex should have it. I told her I wanted to write you a real letter. Oh, she believed you. Well, she's kind of the romantic gesture type, too, if you haven't noticed. Yeah. I don't even know why I'm here. At least we agree on something. I guess I should call Alex and see if I can stay with her. <sighs> what? I, I just texted her. She, she can't take me. Not even for one night. I guess tomorrow is fine, but she's making dinner for something or uh, some. Okay, something. well, let me talk to her. If I could just explain. Then... No, 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 no. Seriously, I, I mean, is is it that bad having me here? Yes. <laughs> Look. Anyway, it's not up to me. Okay, I have to ask Dylan. Okay. And you have got to, I mean, please promise me that you will be out of here tomorrow. I promise. I'll talk to Dylan. You can 
sleep here. I'll get you like a pillow or something. Maddie goes into the bedroom and sits on the bed. After a moment, she shuts her laptop angrily and lays back, exhausted. Blackout. Interior, Dylan's apartment, living room, later that evening. Jackson, visibly uncomfortable, examines the pictures on the wall for lack of anything better to do. Dylan, 29, unlocks the front door and enters the room while talking on her cell phone. Upon her entrance, Jackson becomes even more uncomfortable and slinks down onto the couch. No. No, seriously? It's not freaking art forum, for Christ's sake. Jesus, it's two lines. No. No, fine. 11.30 is... Yes, yes. All right, bye. God. Um... Who the fuck are you? Um, Jackson. Hi. Jackson? Maddie's. Oh. Jackson, Jackson. The Jackson. The X. Fuck. What are you doing here? I'm crashing here. Oh, are you? Uh, Maddie? She's, she went to go get groceries. Oh, Okay, so, Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. Yeah? I've heard a lot about you. Hmm. So what are you doing in my apartment, Jackson? Your apartment? Oh, you're, you're Dylan, you're Maddie's- Partner. Oh. It's, um, Maddie's doing me a favor. It's just for one night, and I swear I'll be gone before you know it. Tomorrow? Yeah, that's the, that's the plan. I mean, yeah. So, um, what, what were you, uh, er earlier? The phone, what, what was that about? I'm not sure that's any of your business. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, sorry. Jackson clearly wants to be there. Uh, so there's this tiny, tiny review on hyperallergenic. It's just this stupid, it doesn't even matter. It's like two lines in the whole page. I mean, oh God, who even reads the reviews anyway? Not me, do you? Does no, anybody? No, no, I mean, really, no. Right? Seriously, just look at this. They didn't even spell the name of the gallery right. I mean, some people will just miss the point no matter what you do. You can try and do something original and you just get like set upon from all sides, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. I don't, I, I don't really know. <laughs> Wait, what? Aren't you like a musician or something? I mean, I was. I... So you must get this crap all the time, right? It's just, it's just all so I don't know, tedious? I'm over it. I just want to go and paint and not worry about anything else. Are you working on anything new? Something different? Well, theoretically, but I don't even have a model yet, so I haven't gotten very far. I mean, it's not like I haven't been looking, but... Well, well it's right. It's got to be the right person, right? Yeah, I'm just... I'm really particular. It just has to be someone I don't know. But, I mean, I can't just draw some rando. But I can't just let some agency do the whole screening process for me either, or they might choose the wrong person. You know, you just get a, a vibe from some people. It's impossible to communicate to someone else exactly what I want, and I don't even know what I want until I see it, you know? Why does it have to be someone you don't know? Because well, my work is its about objectivity, like pure observation, like... Everything's so voyeuristic now with social media and surveillance and all that. And there's also how, you know, people act differently if you're watching them, like, like photons. I try and pick people I've never met, so there's no preconceptions. And every single moment is part of the drawing. Like a time lapse, except it's all at the same time, all layered at once. Can I see? Or, or do, do you have any here? 
No. I mean, I have some stuff here. That's that's mine. The photographs are Maddie's. Of course. But the big ones are all at the gallery or in storage or sold. So how did you guys meet anyway? Uh, we dated when we were at SFAI together. Oh, I mean, she never mentioned you. It was an awkward break breakup. I mean, I was moving down here and she wanted to go back to New York. So it was just kind of. Um, so this is your place, huh? I, and the, the, I mean, that's great that you can make a living off your work. I'm sort of. I teach at Art Center. I do commissions, not as much as I used to, but still. I've got way, uh, ways to go before I'm Damien Hurst. Right, right. Well, for what it's worth, I, I'd buy them if I weren't broke. Thanks. She said I could stay here tonight. Well, this is my place, so technically it's up to me. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, she said she was going to ask you. Right. As if on cue, we hear the sounds of someone at the door. Keys jingling and so forth. Yeah, speak of the devil. Maddie opens the door, bags of groceries in her arms. She nods to Dylan and walks into the kitchen to set down the bags. Then she walks over to Dylan, pointedly ignoring Jackson. Hey, sweetie. Uh, when did you get home? A little while ago. They greet affectionately and kiss. Maddie holds out the kiss slightly longer than necessary, conspicuously. Dylan doesn't seem to notice. Good day? Yeah, it was okay. You? Yeah, well, no. Rejection letter from the Natural Order show at Make. Apparently my artwork isn't right for them at this time, but they look forward to dealing with me in the future. You know, you should make like an art piece from all your rejection letters. You... Right. It... Never mind. I take it you guys have met? Yeah, we... We met. We talked. Okay, well, he's just here a night. I know it's weird. It's cool. I'm okay with it if you are. Blankets and pillows are in the closet. Help yourself to what's in the fridge. Uh, good night. Enjoy that couch. It is the worst. They exit. Jackson's left alone in the living room at a loss for what to do. We follow him as he wanders into the kitchen and opens the fridge. Cut to a flashback. Interior, Maddie and Jackson's old apartment in the daytime. Maddie, now in her late 20s, is less polished than the adult Maddie that we've met already. Wearing pajamas that haven't seen that have seen better days, she walks barefoot into the tiny kitchenette in the apartment she shares with Jackson. The sink is full of dirty dishes. She opens up the fridge, which is empty, save for a few condiments and a shabby looking carton of eggs. She stares into the food free void for a moment and then shuts the fridge. God, I swear I've done this like 50 times today. I mean, you know that thing, that thing where you're hungry, so you go to open the fridge, and then there's like nothing in there that you actually want to eat, so you close it. And then like five minutes later, you're still hungry, so you do it again, because like for some reason you have this idea that maybe somehow the contents of the fridge have changed, but it's still just the same gross stuff as before, and you're just like hoping, hoping desperately that it's going to be different, and it never is. It's just like this hope, like this delusional belief that things are suddenly going to be better just because we really want it. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's what's the alternative? The, the alternative is just like killing yourself. So I think, yeah, I, I guess it's kind of, I don't know, pathetic, but it's either that or suicide. And I think people just want to think that it's just not all that just futility. So that they're just not the, just, you know, wasting their time. I guess. But if that's true, then like, what do you do if that's like what you've done? like? You wake up one day and you're 40 and you realize you've just been completely wasting your time. I mean, is it even possible to, I don't know, recover from something like that? That just doesn't seem possible. I think it's just sort of a question of what you want to do next. I mean, you've had this revelation, so what do you do with that? 
I mean, are you going to keep doing the same stupid thing because it's safe and familiar or do you try something new? But what if you just make the same stupid mistakes all over again? I think the assumption is that what you're going to do is what, I don't know, whatever you should have done in the first place. Look, you, you go and you do whatever it is that you would have done if you hadn't been so worried about, I don't know, car payments or whatever, or else you just, you know, you get divorced, buy a Porsche, date younger women. But, but no, no, seriously, I mean, there's gotta be, there's a limited amount of, I mean, you only live for so long, you can't really afford to make mistakes. Manny, you're not even 30 yet. I really wouldn't worry about it. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't screw up. That's, that's not what I mean. I, I mean, I could be hit by a car tomorrow, and if I made some sort of mistake or something, then I'd never be able to do anything about it. But you'd be dead, so you wouldn't care, right? <sighs> okay, so I'm not dead. I'm just paralyzed, and then now I can't move my hands or anything. I can't even, like, <laughs> wipe my own ass, and so I've totally wasted my life. And there's nothing I can do about it. And it's not like you could do anything about it either. You'd be there all helpless and sympathetic and ineffectual and totally miserable, of course. Because now you're stuck with this vegetable and I'd be miserable too, but I wouldn't even be able to talk about it or express it because like, I don't know, my vocal cords don't work anymore. And I have to talk through one of those voice synthesizer thingies and I'm just, well, I'm fucked, aren't I? Just completely and totally fucked. Eddie. What? You're not paralyzed yet. I lost my job. What? I lost my job. I got fired. What? Why? Well, I don't know, do I? They just fired me. Okay. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know. I mean, what do you say to that? I don't know. I'm sorry, maybe? What? Why? I mean, it's not my fault. No, I, I'm, not, I'm sorry. Like, I feel sorry for you. Like, maybe just show me some sympathy or something. Well, well of course. Uh, of course, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I mean, it, this is so random. I mean, why now? I don't know. Okay, okay. Stop doing that. Doing what? The, like, elongated, okay, thing. It's, I, it's fucking obvious what you actually mean. Okay, what? What, what do I mean? I don't know. You're just being... Like, I don't know, just don't be sarcastic, okay? Just say it. What? It, it, whatever it is that you want to say. I, I, I don't know what just I so, want to say. I mean, Jesus. Have a response. Just come you in have here. no you response? Know, just... All right, God, I'm sorry, okay? I said that already. I'm sorry you got fired. Okay, do you actually want to talk about it? I don't. I, I, or, or would you rather, would you rather just sit there and yell at me? I don't want to talk about it. Well, fine, let's not then. Fine! Good! Cut to interior Dylan's apartment, kitchen, in the evening, present day. Jackson shuts the fridge in frustration, exits back to the living room, and gets a pillow and blankets from the closet to make himself a bed on the couch. Blackout. Interior, Dylan's apartment, in the kitchen, morning, a week later. Dylan is sitting at the kitchen table with her laptop and coffee, black, looking through model photos, clearly frustrated. Jackson enters. Dylan watches as he crosses the kitchen, loudly rummages through the cupboards for a mug, and pours out the last of the coffee for himself. Tell me, how many days has it been? Um, did you find your subject yet? No. All these Instagram darlings look the same. So, I've been thinking. Oh, don't, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> I've been thinking. I, I think you should draw me. What? No. Why not? I'm here. For the moment. I'm here. I'm photogenic. I have no other commitments. I don't think Maddie would be okay with it. She'll be fine with it. Seriously? <laughs> Bullshit. Well, she said I could stay here. Right. For a night. Yeah. Okay. Blackout. Interior. Daytime. Dylan's studio slash bedroom. 
The hole or the president? What? Oh, no, neither. Jackson Brown, actually. What's the hole? Jackson Hole in Wyoming. It's small. Oh, right. So, um, how does this work? Uh, well, why don't you sit down? Nice. Nice. Very candy darling. Is that is that how you sit normally? Should I take off my clothes or something? Do you want to? Absolutely not. Uh, something less patterny. That would be good. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's always awkward at first if you've never done it before. Right. So, how about you? Thomas or Bob? Bob. <laughs> well, technically, though, didn't he take it from Dylan Thomas always, anyway? So, or you're, so you're, wait, so you're kind of named after both of them. Should I be quiet? I, I can stop talking. If it's fine. Can. Just talk away. Okay. Uh, so, you and Maddie, huh? Mm-hmm. Things are uh, good. I don't know. It's it's weird. She never really talked about you. Well, there's probably a lot you don't know about her. Do you say? Granted, I dated her for like two and a half years, whereas you guys have been together for what, what six months? Or are you counting when you were together before? Clearly, you're the expert. You really hurt her, you know? I know. I don't think she's ever gotten over that. And I don't think she's going to. Not on her own. So I have to deal I, so I have a deal to make with you, okay? I just did you a favor back there, so now you're going to do one for me. You're going to apologize. Not now, because I know she wouldn't believe you, but soon. And I don't mean just say you're sorry, because I think you and I both know that's not going to be enough. Because she's never really going to move on until you do. Yeah. Okay. I mean it. Promise me you'll do it. Yes, I promise, okay? Great. Can we maybe talk about something else? Hey, you said I could talk. Well, I changed my mind. Oh, great, because I was actually hoping we'd be able to sit here in awkward silence for the next few hours. Awkward silence is a hazard of the job. A job for which, might I remind you, you volunteered. Hey, you are desperate. I'm doing you a favor here. <laughs> right. I'm the desperate one. Actually, I just really enjoyed throwing myself at the mercy of my ex and her new old lover, who is, by the way, a woman, as well as the most Instagrammed artist in Los Angeles. Oh, been doing some research, have me? I thought we didn't even like art. Says who? Maddie. <laughs> I like art fine. I just don't like all the bullshit. You know, all the stuff about art being this like holy thing like like you need an education to appreciate it properly or uh, how being an artist somehow makes you better than other people there's a difference between following your passion and just like bending over for money society can never have too many great artists but there are plenty of corporate douchebags who needs another one what if corporate douchebaggery is their passion <laughs> i highly doubt it i don't know if everyone only ever did what they wanted, the whole system would collapse. I mean, you sell a product, is you're as much a part of it as they, as they are. Oh, come on. If that were true, I'd be doing matte paintings for porn movies and you'd be scoring them. Artists are supposed to show people something real, something outside themselves, not just like help people give in to their animalistic urges. What about the fauvists? Impressionism for cavemen? Pop art? Repetitive, postmodern tripe legitimized by a sellout in a bad wig. Neoclassicism. Cultural impressional imperialists aping Grecian. Thomas Kincaid? 
Satan. Wow. <laughs> you just managed you've just managed to single-handedly dismiss every major art form the last two centuries. Excuse me, Thomas Kincaid is not a art form. He's a hack. You're giving him way too much credit. He's just making a living? Yeah, by selling people this like whitewashed faux impressionist oddly glowing snow-covered cabin kind of fantasy world. It's not all about making money. I still don't see what's so wrong with giving people what they want. I mean, if no one's buying your stuff, then you aren't you aren't participating. You aren't a part of the equation. It's as simple as that. So what you lose all artistic legitimately if you're not legitimacy if you're not destitute. If you make a living as an artist, you're a sellout. Anyone who makes a living is a sellout. That's the definition of selling out. That's pretty cynical. Well, maybe, but it's true. So what about you? Well, I'm not making a living, so I don't count. Yeah, you're right. You're not making a living. You're just living on my couch. So I tend to think that you don't get to make a judgment like that. You're like critics. You can't actually make the art yourself, so you just stand around and complain instead. That's been my experience. And if you're not part of the system, you might as well not exist. I mean, Possumus sales, fine, but you think Van Gogh was happy? He wouldn't have been happy even if he had his own museum in Amsterdam. The guy was a complete mess. I mean, there are other things in life besides your career. You gotta matter to somebody. Can't you just matter to yourself? I think most people tend to find that pretty unsatisfying. That's why no one's a hermit anymore. Salinger. Yeah, but he did that after he was published, so... I mean, if critics don't matter, why why were you so upset at that about that review? I wasn't. Well, okay, I was, but not because I care. I mean, yes, I care, but only for practical purposes. Like when people stop buying my work, then I'll be worried. It's like just because a movie gets bad reviews doesn't mean it won't be successful. So basically what you're saying is it doesn't matter what critics think as long as you end up in the black. Wait, what? That's not what I'm saying at all. No, no, no. I, I agree with you. Only thing is that that really matters is the bottom line. But that's not... It's not the same thing. I'm not a movie producer. I'm not worried about, like, profit margins. I mean, I have in the past, but right now it's not my priority, and I tend to think that's a good thing. Agreed. So what's your point? Nothing. I mean, clearly, you're just lucky. What? Nothing. Then stop looking at me. Okay, but... But what? It's just... Don't you think you're being just a little bit selfish? What? No. I mean, well, yes, but that's the point of my work. It's about me. It's all about me. That's what makes my work different. Everyone else is so worried about the art market and what people think and what people want, and that's why their art is boring. My art is about the only thing I can ever truly know objectively. It's about me. Well, sort of. It's about me, and it's not about me. It's it's about being a, a, as objective as possible. It's hard to explain, okay? Okay. So, your art is about you, but it isn't. It's objective, but it isn't. And you care about the public opinion, but you don't. I said it was complicated. You know, it's not a bad thing to care about what other people think. I know that. But I don't, okay. so. I mean, if you really didn't care, then you wouldn't be getting so defensive. I'm not getting, look, I didn't hire you to give me pointers on my career, okay? My job is to draw you. Your job, by contrast, is to shut up and sit still. Neither of which you're doing right now, so please, let's just like agree to disagree, okay? Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, it's, your couch, right? It's just, I felt the same way and it, I, I, I just hope you don't end up like me. <clears throat> Dylan and Jackson look up to see Maddie standing in the doorway. 
It's unclear how long she's been out there. Uh, what am I looking at? Uh, so, um, Jackson is going to be the model for my next piece. Oh. I mean, it's so hard to find someone, and he's right here. I'm, I mean, assuming you're okay with it. I'm sorry I didn't ask first. So. Yeah, sure, fine. Are you sure? Yep, it's fine. I, um, I'm just gonna get some air. Maddie grabs Jackson's pack of cigarettes and leaves. Cut to exterior of a Los Angeles street at dusk. Maddie walks angrily down the street, smoking furiously, stomping out a half-finished cigarette. She lights another and then throws that one away too. She stops, head in her hands, overwhelmed. Blackout. Interior, Dylan's apartment the next day. It's late afternoon. Maddie is in the living room on the couch, typing on her laptop. She looks up and we follow her gaze to the open bedroom door. Inside, Dylan is completely engrossed in her work, basically ignoring Jackson, who sits posed on the bed. He squirms for a bit, trying not to move too much. My ass is numb. Can we take a break? Oh, uh, sure. By all means. <sighs> ah, it's late! <sighs> you really get into the zone, don't you? Huh? Oh. Uh, yeah, well, it's easier when I'm not trying to be my own defense witness in the trial of my career choices. Yeah. Uh, that helps. The music. Sad to you, right? Nice. Why don't you ever play any of your songs? I don't know. I mean, you brought your guitar, but you never play it. I play it. I, it's just not... You know, all the time. I, I mean, I don't have anything new. I wouldn't want to be boring. But I've never heard you play anything at all. I don't know what's new or old for you. I just, I just, I don't want to play around, Maddie, okay? Why not? Look, I, I kind of, when we were together, I wrote all these songs about her. So play me one of those. No! Why not? Why do you care so much? I want to hear you play something. I don't, okay, when I've written something new, I'll play it for you, I promise. Uh-huh. Any idea when that will be? I don't know. When I get inspired, I guess. Which will be... Jesus, I don't know! You can't control these things. Well, how long has it been? A while, okay? I don't... Is this really that important? I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like... <laughs> I just have... Like, positions block, you know? So? You think I wake up every day, like, super inspired? You just work through it. You just have to do something every day, even if it sucks. Just like throwing things against the wall until something sticks, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. I've tried that. But everything I write is just, it's crap. Seriously, it's totally boring. But you're never gonna write a song and be like okay that's it that's the song it's perfect and how can you judge it so quickly anyways i can tell pretty fast if something's good or not so then you start something new look i'm glad you found the system that works for you this is just my way of doing things okay okay honestly though at this point i can't even write something bad or or anything anything like i take out i take out my guitar and it's just blank I used to write like five songs a day, you know, like you said, just writing and not even thinking about it. But now, I don't know. What changed? Just lost it, I guess. Anadonia, maybe? It's like when things stop making you happy, the things that used to, it's one of the symptoms of depression. It would be a good band name. You think I'm depressed? I don't know. I think Maddie might be, though. I don't know. She's just been so quiet lately. Because of me? Because I'm here? Well, that probably doesn't help. There's nothing I can really do about that. Well, there is. Oh? 
Have you talked to Maddie about it? About you? Yeah. No, I... It seems kind of manipulative, you know? Maybe you can just insinuate. God, seriously? Is that how you were with her? What? Hey, I mean, talk about mani <laughs> manipulative. You, you're the one who has this like weird plan behind her back. And I'm not saying I don't appreciate it. I mean, obviously I'm benefiting, but still, I mean. I am not manipulative. <laughs> you should just ask her. I mean, I can't believe you're so like, pretty straight with me, almost more than. Well, it's easier to be straight with people you aren't fucking. I just hope nothing is wrong. I mean, I think everyone has one of these stories, right? The psycho ex, literally. I mean, not psychopathic, but clinical, you know? God, this one girlfriend I had just like dove off the friggin' deep end. What, like drugs or something? Yeah, but more just like generally really scarily self-destructive and I, I mean, you want to be supportive, but you can't be someone's therapist, you know? I couldn't even, like, leave the house without worrying if she was going to, you know, do something drastic. After a while, I just gave up. I just couldn't deal with it. God, you don't think Maddie's... No, no. I'm not, I'm not worried about like that she just seems I don't know really not happy but I don't know how much is all this and how much is just like things in general what happened to your ex I don't know she's still alive which you know that's good I think she's still on drugs but the um, prescribed kind God, I'm glad I never had to do anything like that I mean, I would have no idea how, like, Prozac would be, but I know I can't paint for shit if I'm high. Lots of artists do, though, right? Well, I don't know about lots, but... Man, I, I saw some, some some show with what Maddie wants, and uh, it was real strange. Psychedelic acid trippy, like endless fractuals of glowing eyes of stuff. Yeah, a lot of lowbrow guys are really into that style. I do wonder if it's all drugs, though. I mean, I dropped acid once, but it didn't really... I mean, I didn't, like, see anything. Really? Yeah. Huh. Well, maybe it's a left brain, right brain thing. No, I think it might be genetic. Like, it's from rye mold, right? And I, uh, and I read that this whole, whole villages of people used to go crazy and die if the grain stocks went bad. So maybe it's some kind of immuni immunity adaptation or something. Wow. <laughs> well, you really know a lot about some random stuff. Well, mostly about art. Well, well, what about you? I bet you have a lot of random music knowledge, like the scientific name for Beethoven's toenail fungus or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Beethoven was a pretty weird guy, actually. Like, he was kind of a dick. Big Oedipus complex. I mean, he, he just hated his dad. I mean, we, we read some of his letters in music history. So now I look at his music in a totally different way. Kind of makes you wonder what people think of you from just hearing your songs or something. Like when you read a book and then you look at the author's photo on the jacket. And you're like, wow. That is not what I thought you'd look like. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's sort of to be expected. I mean, who has time to, like, no one's going to go do research before they randomly walk by a gallery or, okay, someone hears your song randomly on the radio. Yeah, well, who listens to the radio anymore? Okay, whatever. Your friend plays you a song. You don't know the band or anything about it. You can't even really understand the lyrics the first time you hear the song, much less analyze them for some deeper meaning. And who does that anyway? Like that one song about having sex while you have gonorrhea. I never would have guessed that, that if someone hadn't told me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I guess you're right. But if I get really into something, then I, I, I want to know. I mean, I, I want to do all the research and 
you know, find out what the lyrics mean. All the stories behind the songs and stuff. Yeah, but no one is like that with every band they listen to. Yeah, that's true. Well, there you go. You gotta have something to hook them first, then they become fanatics. Oh my god, you know, just listening to our music, I, I bet people must have thought I was so emo. Were you? Oh, it wasn't everyone when they were 25? No, just skinny guys in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Okay. Want to hear a song? Been warned. I think I can handle it. <laughs> Jackson gets his guitar from the closet and tunes it. Dylan quietly takes out a notebook and begins to sketch him. I can see that. Oh. Well, do you mind? No, no, it's fine. At the end of the summer and the sunflower daytime, when you let all your hair down and the hours start singing all the days that we wandered, we were outcasts and mayflies when you speak. It's a sermon. I hear bells. I hear ringing. In the morning, I see you stumble in the half light. Will you take me a picture? Give me breath, give me insight. Every day in the summer is as hot as the nighttime. I could see through your mirror. We were long past the deadline. In the shipyards, the sunset swallows of every half light. Keep your secrets at arm's length. All my secrets are this kind. Jackson stops playing mid phrase as Maddie appears at the door and enters. After a brief pause, he continues to fiddle with his guitar, but no longer committed to the song. I remember that one. Yeah. I don't think I've heard you play anything since you got here. You know, he wrote a whole album of songs about me. Wow. Yep. Songs for departure. Oh, prescient. Pitchfork had an orgasm. It was a long time ago. Well, it is a really pretty song. Thanks. You should play her the album. I'm sure I have a copy lying around here somewhere. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, anyway, I'll, um, I'll leave you to it. Uh, I guess we should get back to work. Hey, is she like, um, is she like getting into any shows? Some. Not enough. Is that your professional opinion? It's my personal opinion, which is worth a lot more. Well, I mean, we've all been there. I mean, with the band. It was like years just playing anywhere they would take us, you know? That's not quite how Maddie tells it. Well, she's wrong, then. Uh, so why did you guys break up, then? And Maddie? No, your your band. Oh, well, same thing, basically. I mean, I'm not too broken up over it. The band, I not Maddie either. I mean okay. It was a long time coming. And I think if we hadn't, you know, made it or whatever, if we hadn't gotten all the hype and well, money, we'd probably have disbanded way before then. What? Just clash of personalities or no, it's not even that we just none of us were really i think prepared for it or maybe just not everyone was being honest like we weren't all in it for the same reasons i mean i was definitely the driving force in both cases and forming the band and then i mean it was probably just a mistake to begin with but by the time i realized it i didn't want to you know ruin it for everyone when it was just starting to actually be, you know, come together. But in the end, it just kind of fell apart anyway. Is that what you meant then? I don't want you to end up like me? Oh, yeah. Well, just, you know, priorities, I guess, being honest. With Maddie? No, I... I meant with yourself. Oh, well. Yeah, that's a, a good point, I guess. So, 
I mean, the band was just really on the verge of, you know, disillusion. And Maddie's been working to support me, but when she got fired, she's like, my turn. Just when I really needed her helps. So it was like, I'm there, you know, bitching about my problems. When at the same time, at the time I, I was theoretically doing exactly what I wanted to do. So it's like, you know, she stops doing what she loves so I can. Right. And I just felt. Uh, Ungrateful. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like, if you're gonna make yourself unhappy so someone else can do what they want, and then that doesn't even work out, it's just like doubly depressing. You gave it all up and for what? So we broke up and the band didn't last much longer. I guess she said something like that, the last bit at least. Well, she's entitled to her opinion, of course. Wish I could have all this on tape. It'd make a great documentary. Conversations with the overeducated and undersexed. What? You can be overeducated. I'll be undersexed. But seriously, we should get a camera in here and you should like ask Manny to document the process. Or the painting. Mm, I don't know. That's not really her style. I mean, she has that whole abstract macro thing going on. But I'm sure she can do other stuff. Well, sure. But... And it might even help her career. You could just do a joint show type of thing. I don't even know if they'd let me put them up. Even if they just put them in the press or something? I mean, you could put them on your website or Instagram. Okay. Fine. I'll ask her. Tomorrow, okay? I'll ask her tomorrow. Blackout. Interior, bedroom, daytime, the next day. Dylan, Jackson, and Maddie are in the bedroom. Dylan sets up her easel as Maddie hovers nearby, camera in hand. Uh, so how will this work exactly? Uh, well, he poses, I draw, and you uh, shoot, I guess. Right, okay. Dylan sets up, sits at the easel and begins to work. Jackson lounges on the bed and Maddie hovers. Uh, so do you guys talk at all? You know, have a deep artistic discussion about life or something? Um, it's not really. It's not our MO. Uh, I might need to bring in some lights. Oh, don't, please. That's going to really mess up the colors. Oh, okay. Um, I'll just... This one looks different. Different how? Just in general. I mean, it's more... A... Hmm. Yeah, it's intentional, I think. I mean, I didn't start out to do it that way. That way? You know, kind of... Personal? Yeah. Yeah. Because it looks... I don't know. Like he's your friend. Or... You guys were in the same room, at least. Not like he's just some random guy you're watching from a window. Right. Um, do you think my work's impersonal what? in general? No, no, come on. I love your work. You know that. No, I know. I just, do you? <laughs> Stop like it. That? I think this one's really good. Okay? I mean, it's not like you'd be the first person to say that. But I'm, I'm not saying that, okay? Right? Jesus, it, it was a compliment, okay? Okay. <laughs> Sounds like the arguments we used to have. Jackson... Sorry, just funny is all. People are the same no matter what, you know? People change. If they want to. Well, what if someone gets hit by a car and gets paralyzed? That's a change. 
situation's different, but I remember reading that even if you become a paraplegic or you win the lottery, you after three months, you're just as happy or, un or unhappy as you were before. So what? We're just doomed? That's defeatist? How convenient. I guess, but it makes sense. I mean, you. What about me? Nothing. Fuck you. What? What? Oh, come on. I know exactly what you're going to say because it's the same bullshit you always... Like, it's so fucking easy for you to judge me. I'm not, I'm not judging you. Yes, you are. You said the exact same thing. You're so fucking full of crap. I mean... Oh, fuck it. God, I, I, you're so... What? I don't know. Predictable. Just get a new line already. Oh, sorry. I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be more creative. Just fuck off. I'm sorry, okay? It's just, I, it, it, it's just you really don't seem happy. I mean, in general. <laughs> what? What do you mean? With Dylan? Maybe. Yeah. Oh, God. Why do you even care? Because I care about you. Really? Because, you know, I was doing fine with Dylan before you showed up from the other side of the country, uninvited, unannounced, just really unwelcome, if you ask me. But no one did, so I didn't protest. But I do not want you here. I never did. I know you didn't. You don't. I said one night. One night, and it, I shouldn't have even. I, and, and yet, you're still here somehow. <laughs> Dylan asked me to stay, okay? She asked me. Why? I mean, she doesn't even know. Oh, God, please don't tell me. Don't tell me you guys are fucking. No! Why would you think that? I. <sighs> What am I supposed to think? You spend all day together, even when you're not painting. We're not allowed to take breaks? But when I, when I go in, you always stop. I'm sorry, I just, I can't help but think. Well, we're not, so. And God, I mean, the way you guys act around each other? Why didn't you say something? I didn't want to accuse you of anything. Well, kind of late for that. It's not like you've been particularly open or anything. I come home and you guys are suddenly, like, all buddy-buddy and... Just, why him? Of all people, I mean, he can't be that good of a model. He's cute, I'll give you that, but for a complete jerk, but... I mean, you can pay me to spend all day. Because you wanted me to apologize to you. You already did. Yeah, but it didn't seem like it really stuck. Well, I haven't heard anything since then. What have you been waiting for? Um, I don't know. Maybe I needed to actually mean it. I mean, I think maybe you needed to, yeah. yeah. So what, you didn't before? I don't know where you guys get this idea that I'm still hung up on you because I'm not. I mean, there's a reason, okay, that I came all the way out here and it's not because I was hoping you would follow me. Are you sure? People only run that far if they're trying to get away from something. Well, whatever. There's definitely a problem here, but it's not me. Look, for what it's worth, I am sorry. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I had the wrong reasons. Come in here. Well, I don't know what you were expecting. Look, I know I was a jerk. Yes. But do I wish you had given me a chance to, you know, not be one? Yeah, I mean, God, your face when you open that door. You can't force these things. You act like this is all me, but notice I didn't hunt you down and like go fuck with your life. And God, you know, I want to forgive you just to prove that I don't care, but I do. 
Finally. Dylan, I... It's okay. That doesn't bother me. What I don't get is why you don't trust me. What? God, maybe you could start by not going behind my back? I mean, Jesus, I read the press release. His name's all over it. Jackson, 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 fucking Jackson. Daddy, come on. I mean, honestly. I didn't write it. I'm still not convinced that you aren't. Seriously? This is such bullshit. You spend every waking moment with the guy, and now your names are, what, appearing in print together? It's a fucking press release. What's next, page six? God, you are so fucking off the mark. This is not about you. Oh, obviously, because your priorities are clearly elsewhere. I am not going to apologize for caring about my career. Which apparently leaves you no time to care about anyone else, except, of course, Jackson. How exactly am I helping him? What? I'm not even paying him. Publicity. Yeah, sure, because he's so desperate to break into the thrilling and lucrative world of art modeling. Oh, so what? You're just using him? I figured it was fair since he was trying to use me to get to you. I did him a favor. <laughs> Lots of favors going around. Seems like everybody's getting something out of this. Except me. Maddie. Maddie, please, come on. This will all be over in, like, a day, and he'll leave, and everything will go back to normal. I promise. <laughs> This did a 180 from normal the second you put paint on that canvas, and it is way too late for that. Look, look, Maddie, please, look. This is going to be the best piece I've ever done. Yeah. I sure hope so. Maddie stomps over to the door and leaves without looking back, slamming the door for emphasis. Blackout. Interior of an art gallery, evening. A few months later, Dylan's opening at the gallery, the atmosphere of a party. Everyone is drinking white wine from plastic cups and talking animatedly. Jackson's music plays over the buzz of a small crowd. Dylan and Jackson are standing together in front of the painting. Why do they only have white wine at these things? You know how many people show up to these things for the free booze? White wine doesn't stain. Ah. Uh. God, I can't believe it sold already. That's like rent for a year. No, oh, this is nothing. I've been to ones where the whole show was pre-sold before it even opens. Why bother there to have the opening then? Exposure? Publicity? The jealous glares of Otis Undergrounds? Well, congratulations. Thanks. Don't, don't get too excited. You might pull something. <laughs> hey, hey, thanks for playing my music. You're welcome. I mean it. Thanks, really. You've done so much. Don't mention it. I mean, we both, you know, got something out of it, right? Right. Well, this is great. I mean, you must be, well, satisfied at least. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to need more wine. Yeah, I'll, uh... I'll get that for you. Ah, the red dot of success. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. It's really pretty amazing. Thanks. A quote, masterpiece. Well, their words, not mine. I mean, it's a good thing, right? Not if it means my career's peaked at 29. Well, most people will never even have that. Right. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm glad it's old. I just hope it's not all downhill from here. <laughs> Masterpiece. What does that even mean, anyway? It's just one of those words people throw around, you know? No, it's not. You know what I thought about? If you think I'm such a psycho. Dorothy Podber, she walks into the factory with Billy and a Great Dane, takes off her gloves, puts a bullet through a stack of Marilyn's. And of course, they become even more famous and valuable than the rest of them. You want to shoot my painting? <laughs> no. It's just... 
there's nothing really I can do, is there? I don't, I don't think there ever was. I have the photographs if you want them. Here, you can do whatever you want with them. I, I don't even care. God, these are, wow. Really, I'm. Dylan comes to one photo that has Dylan and Jackson in the shot and Maddie reflected in a mirror. And Dylan falters. I, um... I wish there was something we could have... We could have used them. 15,000, huh? Was it worth it? Maddie looks up to meet Dylan's gaze. Dylan looks hurt and confused. She glances at the painting and then back at Maddie. Blackout. The end. All right. All right. Wow. Thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone, I'd like you to be. <laughs> I'd like you to meet Megan Duffy, who I think just gave us a glimpse of her natural state. Um, <laughs> uh, no pants, right? I'm an <laughs> uh, Megan Duffy, who has a, a, a glass in her hand, as, uh, as do I. Megan, here's to you. Cheers. You, Jason. Thanks so much for hosting. I'm drinking um, a sparkling rosé out of an Eiffel Tower wine glass. Uh, lovely. And I am drinking a local scotch made by Lost Spirits Distil Distillery, which is in downtown Los Angeles. This is their. Yeah, it's like uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory for adults. Anyway, um, I hope everybody is enjoying themselves. I hope everybody enjoyed the show and I hope everybody has a drink. Uh, now we're going to talk to the actors and we're going to talk to Megan, who directed this show. Megan brought this show to me about a month ago after we did another show together. Uh, uh, as part of No Pants Theater. So, Megan, what what sparked your interest in Naomi's, in Naomi's screenplay? I know you know Naomi Frank, and she sent it to you. So what sparked your interest? What was it about this play, um, about yeah, this screenplay? Witten actually sent the script to me a couple of years ago because um, uh, I, I direct music video and some narrative stuff, and it was brought to me of a, what do you think and it this is it's three characters two and a half locations it would be relatively easy logistically to shoot um is this something you'd be interested in and i read the script and i thought um it posed some interesting questions and it's witty and uh funny but i didn't think at the time that there was a whole lot of interest in small scripts with only three characters and two and a half locations uh yeah. however <laughs> Um, now we're in this pandemic world where that's all that anyone is interested in. in these kind of yeah. Scenarios. So you have a small crew, one location, uh, less actors, less people to infect with a virus. So I, I thought to myself, like, you know, send that to me again. Let me give it a read. And, um, and I did. And, and I said, okay, there's, and there's something here. And, then I brought it to you and, and, you know, let's maybe give this a little bit of a life. Fantastic. What, that, what else are we doing? <laughs> what else are we doing? Exactly. And so uh, speaking of, of a three character play, there are three actors who just did a wonderful job and I'd like to invite them to turn their cameras on now so that I can uh, give them a round of applause. Uh, there's Daisy Egan. Woo! Daisy is a regular with No Pants Theater Company, primarily because she rarely wears pants and it was a default <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, Wit and Frank. And we've got Rico E. Anderson. Uh, you guys can rename yourselves if you want, but hey, here's to you. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, great job, guys. So, for Woo! those of you who are watching right now, we are on a 30 second delay. So what I just said right now, you just heard 30 seconds from now, but I'm watching the chat on YouTube. So if any of you have any questions for Megan, Daisy, Witten, or for Rico or for me, for some reason, why would you want to know anything about me? Uh, go ahead and ask and I'll try to attend to everything. So, um, so Daisy, I'm gonna start with you because you are no stranger to uh, doing these virtual readings. Um, 
how you been? And uh, what what piqued your interest in doing the screenplay? Because for those of you who don't know, the, literally Daisy's door is constantly being knocked upon to be in people's readings. She is one of like she's at the top of a very short list of shortlisters because she's Daisy Egan. I don't I don't know if any of that is accurate, but it's um, absolutely accurate. <laughs> it was accurate when I read this when I first read this script. Um, I when I the Dylan character, I said there's no other person who could play this and other than yeah. Daisy. Well, I've, thank you so much. I've known Megan for a long time now. I think we met on New Year's 2008 or nine. You came to a yes. party through. Yes, yeah. the notorious party. Um, <laughs> and uh, Megan and I uh, became friends and we've kept in touch all these years. And um, Jason, I've known you from the blank, I guess, the blank theater Yeah, company. I think like something like 10 years now. Yeah, so uh, I think you asked me to be a part of the, the first reading, you know, and it was like the very early days of this plague, and uh, it was like a, you know, it was like a new world. What, how are we going to present these things now? And of course, now it, it's, everything happens so fast in this world. Now it's like old hat. Everyone's doing these. But you were the innovator, Jason. <laughs> um uh, I actually haven't done one in a while, uh, but I'm glad to be sort of back doing it. It's a logistical nightmare um, be just because of like crappy Wi-Fi and my son wants to be playing Minecraft and also watching Power <laughs> Rangers. And it's a lot of <laughs> bandwidth um, and I don't have a lot of bandwidth. Uh, but anyway, Megan asked me to do this and I didn't even I didn't even need to read it before I said yes, just because I, I trust her and I love Witten and um so I said yes, and I'm, I'm glad I did. It's a nice way to spend a Friday early evening. Yeah, it is. It is a wonderful way. And let me just give some shout outs here. So so uh, Sasha Kerbel is saying hello. She says, great job. And Andrew Ford says this was great. And Tanya Dash gave us a lot of uh, Simpson hands because they're yellow. Uh, watch Me Watch Stuff, which is a great screen name. Uh, thought it was great. Uh, Carla Vega, I think I said it was great. And uh, Rob Nagel wants to know if I muzzled Atticus. No, I did not. Uh, and uh, and before I get to Rob's question, uh, I'd like to introduce you all to Witten. So Witten and I know each other, but we cannot figure out how. So there's the, you're, Witten, you're on mute, just so you know. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we can't figure out how. So now, Witten, yes, you have a personal relationship to this play because I mean the screenplay because your sister wrote it. Um, but I'm going to assume your sister writes a lot of things and is an incredibly talented person. So what is it about this screenplay in particular that called your name? And what made you think of Megan and Daisy? Uh, actually, so my sister wrote this almost 10 years ago um, when she was still at USC in, the, in their drama department and uh, put it on for their, I think the graduate students put on plays and they cast people and they do that. And I watched it and I remember sort of reading through it and I was like, this is very good. There's something about this that is incredibly compelling and very human. And at the time, there were actually a lot of movies being made like this. There, it was the sort of renaissance of the indie film stuff with Funny Ha Ha, Laurel Canyon, Half Nelson, all those films where we got to see sort of the kitchen sink drama side of films. And I felt like this very much fit into that category, just kind of showing people being themselves no matter the situation in a very Chekhovian way of like, mm. we don't change that much and we make a lot of the same mistakes over again, but, and that's what's funny. So it has this real kind of sort of soft focus, like, oh yeah, that's life. <laughs> Uh, I love that you brought, I, I love that there's a shout out to Chekhov there. Fantastic. Oh, yes. You know, it's so Chekhovian. No landscapes, but Chekhovian nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> we have a few people who are saying, you know, it's so great to see live theater again. So uh, apparently there's a bunch of people watching who haven't experienced one of these uh, Zoom reads yet. Oh. Even though we are on YouTube we're, YouTube, we're going through Zoom. So for those of you who, who liked this or are interested or even someone who wants to, you know, do some smack talk, go ahead and hit subscribe because we do a lot of these and... Uh, teaser, uh, we're kind of reinventing it. And in about a month, you're going to see something that no one's done yet. Uh, maybe because it's not possible, but uh, if it works out, it's going to be pretty darn cool. Uh, Rico. So yeah. uh, Rico Anderson joined us. Rico, is this your first like Zoom read? Have you done them yet? 
Well, first of all, I apologize. My my internet just decided to crap out on me, which is why I was out of here. Thank God it happened now as opposed to during the during the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, talk about timing. Um, no, this is uh, this is well. I've I've done I've done a lot of Zoom things. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, this is not this was not my first. So let me ask you this. What what do you enjoy about this? Because everyone always assumes damage. Like everybody always assumes, well, what's the hardest part? Well, what do you like about this? Like, what is it about doing these reads with actors who could be anywhere in the country, um, but that are in front of you on, on your computer screen? What do you enjoy about it? And what does it bring out of you as an actor that is different? I, you know, I, I as, as actors, we like that we, we like that challenge. We like that challenge of being um, a, something thrown at us that maybe we're not used to. And uh, there's a lot of Zoom calling and meetings and gatherings happening. Um, I love the fact that there is, an, uh, there is this evolution now in theater where you can put on uh, a piece and it can be just as powerful. I mean, not, look, nothing beats live theater, but when you have when you have a, a piece like this, it it just it, you still it is it, like for me. Whenever I see live theater, I don't, and I've only seen like maybe one other one other thing, but I don't see it as as just a, a reading on on camera. I I, I see theater. I see the the, the theater yeah. experience. It, even though yes, it's different and stuff like that. So it's fun. It's different. It's um. It's it's where we're at right now. I mean, it's not going to be forever, but it's um, it's it's a fun new way of 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 doing something, and while while trying to be as true as possible, while just looking forward. I mean, yeah. So, you know, you hit something there. I think. Um, oh, thank you, Tanya, and thank you, uh, Rachel. Who, uh, or it might be Rochelle, but I'm going to go with Rachel, oh, uh, okay. who uh, yeah. who just subscribed. But uh, but Rico, I think you hit something there because. This does open up a lot of opportunities, and it might actually open up our opportunities once we can convene again, because now we have the ability to rehearse with people around the world, whether it's for a film or whether it's for a stage play or even a radio play, whatever it is, and, and we could collaborate with people and then just fly in for the performance or a brush-up rehearsal. So it really opens opportunities of collaboration with the design team, the actors, the writers, everybody. Uh, Megan, I'm going to come back to you. This is uh, one of your first times directing in this medium, uh, because you know My you are a film time you... directing. Yeah, it's your first time. Okay, great. Yeah, directing theater. The last time I directed theater, um, I was about five years old, bossing around kids in the backyard. I had no friends when I was a kid. I was super bossy because I was like, "What do you mean play? I want to work." <laughs> Um, you know, I, I never saw play as, as just like, I was like, no, this is a purpose. There's a story. Why aren't you sticking to the narrative I've given you? Anyways, I didn't have a lot of friends, but, um, so it was the last time I directed any kind of theater and, um, you know, it's funny cause then I moved to LA and, and, you know, now I, I, I actually get paid sometimes to boss people around, which is refreshing. Um, my mom is, is, um, He's delighted by that because she was worried about me for a while. But um, yeah, I I haven't directed. So you're so you're bossy no pants basically. Yeah, I'm bossy no pants. That's my okay. that's actually that, my real name. I didn't, haven't disclosed that. Um, that's the power of commitment. You did it as a kid, and you're doing it now. And now somebody's <laughs> paying it for it. She yeah. had a <laughs> she had a vision, and she stuck with it. She could have given it up because everyone but was she like, did oh, it. Man, "You're too bossy, girl. You gotta stop nope. that." Uh, I mean, like, I, Rico, her mama didn't raise no quitter. Okay, okay. She stuck with it, and here we are. I think basically it's also like because we're in quarantine, um, I'm regressing, so I'm turning into my five-year-old self. But um, I direct um, a lot of music video. I was a music video and commercial and indie producer for years, um, so I kind of understand logistically how things go. And um, I was just... I also worked in casting for a while, so I've I've um, directed a lot of actor performances, and I was just really itching to be able to use those creative muscles. And I think it came about actually. Um, I've set up a quarantine cafe in my front yard where I sit in a chair here, and then someone sits in a chair eight feet away with their own little table that I've made out of a cardboard box that has a tablecloth on it, Lovely. and um, and there's usually like fresh flowers, and then. 
Um, I make a seasonal cocktail or sometimes wine, depending on uh, coming over. Yeah. And so, and then they sit there and I sit here and it, it, it's been uh, such a great thing for, I think, not only my mental health, but my friend's mental health, uh, because it gives us a, a moment to kind of hang out as if we're out and about having dinner together, except, um, you know, we're still pandemic. I love it. Um, I love it. The quarantine and, cafe. Yeah. And this came about, Witten came over yeah. Yeah. and I think we got drunker than we should have. And then I was like, we, I should, we should make something. And then she was like, we that script. And I was like, we that script. Right. Great. Well, uh, hmm, that's, that's a real peek behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, let reaction. me ask you a question because I, you know, Megan and, and Whitner are actually going in this direction. Now, Rob Nagel has an excellent question here and I open this up to everybody. So just, you know, just give me one of these. So we know who's going to talk first, but have you, have all of you had an opportunity during the quarantine to use it to create new and original uh, work? Are you developing new works? I know Daisy, as we talked about it briefly and you're nodding. So Daisy, what are what have you been developing during the quarantine and how has this helped your creative process? Um, I have, I've been, I feel like I've been transitioning as a woman of a certain age in Hollywood. Uh, I've been 24. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been transitioning into m more writing. I mean, I've been a writer for a long time, but um, since my entire industry shut down, uh, you know, I've, I've started focusing on writing a lot more and being way more disciplined about it than I have ever. Um, and I have a writing partner who I've known for about 30 years and we've, um, we've finished a web series and then we wrote a full length pilot out of that and now we're writing another web series and I just finished an essay that I'm, I'm gonna submit to the Times and uh, I'm starting a, a, like a middle grade reader novel. I'm writing a ton right now. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, why the fuck not, you know? Let me ask you a question, Daisy. So now that you're writing, and you're writing multiple things. So do you have, do you put on your calendar? Because you said you've gotten more disciplined about it. Are you putting it on your calendar? This is writing time and sticking with it. Because I know you have a small child at home and you got a lot going on. You're, you know, you're now a home schooler and a teacher and a writer and a performer. So how do you balance it? Um, I, it's not easy. And the first uh, March, April, May, three and a half months were bad. Good math. Uh, Good math. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, uh, they were bad. I spent most of those months just in a constant state of like near terror. Uh, and then somewhere in mid June, I just had this like sliver of a window where I was like, I can't keep living this way. And so I, I changed a lot of my habits. And um, so now, <laughs> so, so silly. I mean, it's not silly, but it's silly. I wake up, uh, the first thing I do when I wake up is I, uh, I do a meditation and I do like a little like check-in on an app and then I sit down and I write. That's um, great. Yeah, and oh, and I'm also working on a podcast which I'm writing. So it's not like, I, I don't have it written down like today you're gonna work on X, Y, Z, but I'll know sure. like I have a deadline of this or I'm excited about this today and that's the thing that I'll sit down and, and focus on. And mm -hmm. um, and my son has been watching a lot of Power Rangers. As you do. That's the only way I get yeah. time. Uh, Rico, in a moment, I'm going to come to you. And then Whitney, I'm going to come to you after that. And then Megan, I'm going to ask you the same question. But before I do, Daisy touched on something. A lot of you watching this are performers or are creatives. And some of you just like to be entertained. But she touched on something important there, which she said was silly, but I, I believe is actually paramount to being successful. Uh, it, it's fine to, to practice. It, that's great to practice. And it's great to see what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? But if the why gets lost of why I'm doing this, uh, then creative, creativity tends to wane a bit. And so what Daisy is doing is finding ways to, uh, to increase her mental state's well-being before jumping into something that is artistically important to her. Because I don't know why when we get older, we think we can just snap our fingers and be the best we can be. I know I used to think that forever, uh, but then I got smart, I married Grace Serrano, and now I'm closer to the best I can be. Uh, and so, 
but Daisy has tapped into how important mindset is and how important spiritual connectivity is in her art. Uh, so as you answer Rico, Witten, and Megan, I'd also be curious to know what you do to manage your mental state and your mindset and your spirituality as you, uh, also, you know, go forward. I also want to say that I've given up coffee. Uh, I oh. switched to tea. It's a huge, it makes a huge difference. Really? Uh, yes, because I was... It, it was like I could have two cups and then I'd have anxiety and then it was like a cup and three quarters and I'd ha have anxiety then it was a cup and a half and then it was a cup and I was like this is bonkers so I switched to tea um, I also go to therapy and I'm also heavily medicated <laughs> all the time. And, and that's why we uh, love you <laughs> and I don't drink as much as I was again the first three and a half months of this I was like oh it's three o'clock I think I can get away with starting to drink and I just like drink myself into oblivion and I realized I had to sort of put the kibosh on that because it's goofy I'm sorry I sent you so much wine no I'm gonna I'm going camping tomorrow so I'm gonna bring it on the camp yeah and Daisy knows where I live so she can always send some to me uh Rico uh what's going on with you same same kind of question there yeah um I've been doing a lot of writing um this is this was a great time to uh, uh, kind of weird saying a great time, but it was it was a time to be able to catch up on projects and uh, just get in touch with yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I've also um, I, I also started a a, a podcast actually a, a YouTube uh, talk show. Um, really, with two other friends of mine called the Lightning Hour. And we are we're all the co-hosts and I believe they're on here right now. Hey. The lightning hour. Yeah. The lightning hour. The cast was amazing and the script was beautiful. Awesome. Lightning. Um, lightning hour. <laughs> yes. Michelle Henry and Sasha Kerbal, my two co-hosts. And and um yeah, we all created it um out of quarantine. We it's something that we spoke about for a few months and uh we decided at, at this time to go ahead and launch it. And uh we've we've had really great success with it. This has been a lot of fun. We've we've had some amazing guests. Um We've had a 16-year-old uh, prodigy, Cameron Nino. We have uh, Paul Anthony from Full Force for people who um, uh, uh, people who are big fans of music in the 80s and the early 90s. And Heck yeah. Uh, gosh, uh, Gloria Garayua from uh, Reckoning, uh, Christian Hutcherson from um, from from uh, from Dark, blanking out here. So and um, yeah, and actually just yesterday we wrapped our first season, and um, we are currently starting our second season next week. And um, yeah, we're 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 on fire and we're and we're off. So that's that that's something big that came out of it. And so yeah. very very uh, happy about that, proud about that. Um, but also really looking forward to getting back on set as well. Mm. And um, you know, just staying home, staying safe. Sometimes I just veg out too, you know. And and you know that's okay. I, I think it's okay for people to just kind of just be. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, the lightning hour. Please like, subscribe. Uh, yeah, and, uh, everyone, the lightning hour. Yes. Subscribe. Tell yes. two friends. They'll tell two friends. It'll be incredible. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Rico, you're absolutely right. Sometimes doing nothing is the best thing you can do. Um, sometimes vegging out is great when I you binged, know you're so busy. I binged all nine seasons of Married at First Sight since, <laughs> since we've been Oh my gosh. I'm not proud uh, of it, but it's something I did. Hey, before before we get to Witten uh, to answer the same question, you know, Naomi in the screenplay uh, makes uh, makes some light of, of art at times and talks about movements and what, what constitutes a movement and whatnot. I wonder what we as a, as a species are going to see coming out two to five years from now. And when we look back towards the end of our lives, when we look at art history books and cinema history and theater history, and, and we look back at this time, is there going to be a new movement based on this pandemic? It's a, the first global pandemic in over a hundred years. So it's interesting. I wonder what will come of this. And if it's something that brings life and light to the world, at least there's something here. That is redeemable. Uh, Witten, uh, what are you working on? How do, and how do you work on it, you know? Uh, just very briefly, since you mentioned movements, I know when Naomi first wrote this, uh, it was 2008, 2009, and 
a lot of the stuff that was happening then was trying to be diverse, but it was diverse in a very like, this is a show about trans people. That will be the focus. This is a show that has a black person. Like it was very, it was almost, it was tokenizing in the, with the best intentions, but it was still highlighting that as opposed to just portraying everyone as, as normal people. And so this play sort of came out of that in just that, you know, the, the queerness in it isn't a thing. That's not the focus. It's just people having no relationships like everyone does, making the same mistakes that everyone else does. And so in a way it was a response to a movement uh, that was going on at the time. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> um, I, yes, <laughs> I have actually been very lucky. Uh, I've had quite a bit of work during the pandemic. I do um, audiobooks and voiceover. You have an amazing voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's just so soothing. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that's what they tell me. Jason. And they are right, as they always are. <laughs> yes. So I... I uh, I do, I've been doing a lot of that, actually, and I did a, a rom-com podcast, which did very well, sort of a scripted podcast. Uh, and then I've also been dabbling in the world of VR and immersive really? theater, yes. So currently, I am actually in a production of The Tempest that takes like place. Like right now? You're, you're in it yes, right now? As, as we're doing this, I am also- Now. Everything you're seeing is happening now. Yes. <laughs> That's what the headset allows you to do. It makes you <laughs> project to places. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a live VR immersive performance. So on your Ooh. Oculus headset, you buy a ticket in this, in this game called The Under Presents. And the Under, yes. attend a show, a uh, one-actor show, and we take you through the world of the tempest and you get to play various characters and we sort of endow the actors with all or the players with all sorts of things um but i was the group the company tender claws that does this their game company i'd been hired by them in november hmm. to do their under game which is just sort of you are playing a video game in vr and then you will occasionally meet uh avatars that are actually actors in real time interacting with you so it's almost like sleep no more but virtually very like sleep no more i know that that company punch drunk had a huge influence on the designers that's phenomenal yeah. you're you're on the forefront of of the future of theater <laughs> it's pretty that's, cool yeah that's amazing um send me that info oh, because sure. i want to i want to get involved in that and, uh and it, if you have the the website put it in the chat so everybody can see it the chat on youtube not the chat yeah. on on here and um Actually, someone just gave you a shout out. Kara Mandel yep. just said uh, she's wonderful in the under. So, Kara, respect. Kara's great. She works for Meow Wolf. And nice. Uh, Megan, what have you been, what's been keeping you busy? And, you know, in a moment, we're going to end our talk back. And Megan has a big announcement because there's apparently a virtual uh, after party. <laughs> so, so um, you know, it's like I'm a. Uh, uh, primarily a, an actor for a living. Um, and then, you know, I, dab I dabble in directing and I uh, also do portrait photography. So pre-pandemic, my entire life was a hustle. It's just every day, it's like, okay, what are the seven calls I'm gonna make in this meeting and this happy hour and this interview? So, um, you know, when all of that stopped and I was just at home, um, rather than force myself to create art that was coming from a place of desperation, I started looking around my space that I live in and I said, well, what changes can I make? And I just wanted to feel like I had control over something. So I actually redid my kitchen. And when I say redid, I repainted it. Um, I wall, I did like a, one of those removable wallpaper backsplashes. Um, I, I, uh, you redid it, you redid it. I mean, I didn't like rip out the cabinets and stuff because I rent, I don't own. And that seems like a big expense to, you know. Yeah. To but, um, you know, I had these big cumbersome kind of half broken closet doors on my bedroom closet. And it's some someday I just went and I took them down and threw them away. And I put up a tension rod and cool curtain. So it just that's kind of that's been my art is just creating a space where every every place that I look feels good. 
Um, cause for me, I, I think every artist, we struggle with our mental health. We never know where our next gig's going to come from, what's happening, just do people like what we made and, and was I, there's just a lot going on all the time. So if I could have control over something, then I knew that I would feel better and then I would be able to, uh, conquer the rest of what we were dealing with. Um, so it was yeah. kind of. That's been kind of my art is uh, uh, maybe I'll become an interior designer. I'm not very good, but I. <laughs> That's a great sales pitch. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That was, <laughs> that was kind of, and then, um, you know, I participated in a lot of uh, zoom readings and plays, things like that. Um, trying to help other people bring their, their art to life. Um, also uh, being a consumer of a lot of art. You know, there was a, a time a year ago if someone said, oh, come to my play that's at this black box theater in Hollywood, I'd be like, oh, I'm so busy. And they'd be like, I didn't tell you the date yet. And I was like, oh. And now I'm like, you play? I'm there. What time? I'll watch it twice. Like, and it's just, and, but I'm actually. <laughs> I, just, I just know I'm busy that day. Yeah. I mean, but not just because a little, it's a little bit of just, um, not because I know people who do bad art. Everybody is pretty talented that I know, um, but just more of uh, not finding the space for it. So because I have a lot of space now, I'm able to to consume all of the things that I wouldn't otherwise. And um, I'm learning a lot more. Um, I'm getting to know people's work a lot better. And so that part's been exciting. That's and then great. the Quarantine Cafe, which yeah. you'll have, you and the lady should stop by sometime. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have two chairs. But only okay. one person, so one of you well, will be the, I mean, listen, you and I get along well, but the best part about me is Grace. So, I mean, like, that's the only reason to know me is that you'll meet Grace someday. Yeah, well, I'm so. better if I invited both of you and not just you. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> I'm uh, so, uh, Megan, tell everybody about this after party where I believe DJ Witten is going to be spinning some, <laughs> some, some yeah. sick tunes. All right, so um, one of, um, Witten's my very good friend, and one of the coolest things about her, um, and we had met, we did a commercial together in 2010, and then we kind of, we had a great time hanging out, but we lost touch, and then I ran into her again in 2012, and she was DJing this candy lamb theme party at a castle in Laurel Canyon, and spinning all this really amazing vintage swing and jazz music, and that was something that never came up, when we were working together that this was it felt like a whole other side of her um that i was intrigued by and uh pre-pandemic time she is one of the ballroom djs at clifton's on the weekend so if you went to clifton's and you went to the swing the swing ballroom where people are you know in 2019 were fully 1940 swing dancing in los wow. angeles um she would be off she would dj in between the jazz sets so um uh, and she's been doing a really cool thing every other Saturday um, where it's just an open party to whoever wants to come and it's her and some other DJs and they give you a little bit of history about the songs and there's cocktail tutorials and live performances. And 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 for me, the thing that I miss most about pre-pandemic life is the ability to go places and connect with people and share experiences with them in person. So going dancing, having a cocktail, going to dinner, um, mm you know, seeing other people walk by, smelling them. So I, and I think a thing that's so exciting when you do a show, um, you know, even if it's a film show, is that after party where you celebrate how hard you've worked and their yeah. bar, and then you actually get to have the conversations with people that you don't get to have when you're working. And a lot of times for me, that's where my future relationships in terms of work are built in those nice. yeah. where you're, a let your guard down and you're like okay i've already I already have the footage i can't get fired now i can be myself and so i thought how cool to try and do something like that virtually and maybe yeah. maybe you won't but uh witten goes by the name dj little red so dj little red and it's open to everyone who's hello little girl <laughs> But we're opening it up to, it's a Zoom link um, that'll be live probably in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and it's really easy to find. It's just tinyurl.com slash work of art after party. And I'm going to put it in the chat. But yeah, post it in the watch, chat. Everybody who yeah. watched can go ahead and join in. Uh, you can invite friends. And it's kind of just a virtual hang. Um, you can 
chat with people who were part of it. If you have personal questions you didn't want to ask in the chat here. Um, but uh oh, I'll, Pandora. <laughs> don't want to. If those people don't respond, they don't have to. And we're gonna hear some music, and uh, people can have a drink and hang out, or have a soda water and hang out. And um, I don't know. It's just an experiment. Well, like that's fantastic. So before we go, uh, Witten, uh, followed by Rico, and then Daisy if she comes back. Uh, Witten, a final thought before we head to your after party? Oh, um, wow, not to sound too cheesy, but I guess that it's never too late to do something. Like I said, this has been a project that I've been dreaming about for 10 years. And uh, thanks to Megan and to you, Jason, and of course to Daisy and Rico, we're sort of starting on that journey uh, and seeing where it goes. So uh, that kind of, oh, getting all clumped. <laughs> um, thank you. But yeah, I think that's my final thought. So thank, thank you. And also, you know, you never, you just never know. You never do. Uh, and uh, Rico, a final thought from you, my friend. Yeah, um, you know, we are all creatives here and creatives create no matter what, no matter what's going on. And I think one of the, one of the, one of the things that during this pandemic, the civil rights movement, everything that's going on, the one thing that we always um, lean towards in terms of um, just being able to move on in whatever way that is, is entertainment. Um, and it, you know, be it music, you know, like Witten, you know, spinning on the ones and twos, or, you know, you creating a theater company, Megan going Rawr, and ripping down her, uh, her, her, uh, her, her uh, kitchen and stuff like that, but also directing and, and just writing, creating a talk show. Um, this is what we do. We find a way to keep it moving and to keep entertaining. And, and I think this is a beautiful thing that uh, is happening with what you've created with this. I think it's 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 a beautiful thing with uh, bringing um, this piece to life. And I'm, I'm very honored to be a part of it. And um, thank you. I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you for having me on board. I, I hope to continue to be there. Well, it was, it was our pleasure. And and to, to exactly what you just said, you and I just met because yeah. of this. And Literally. now and now we know each other. Uh, Megan, a final thought before I send uh, a, before I say goodbye to everybody. Well, first, I want to say thank you so much, Jason, for coming up with this idea for hosting, uh, for for giving creatives a way to create during this really difficult time. And I think a final thought to me is I just want to um, say to everyone who's watching, who's having a hard time struggling, even if you're not, anybody who's having a hard time struggling, artist or not, um, is to be kind to yourself and don't be hard on yourself. This is um, an experience that we are are sharing with everyone globally means all around the world and it's an experience unlike anything that we've had before so if you feel creative amazing do that if, if you don't feel creative that's okay too um we're all doing our best and um yeah just be kind to to yourself that's great god i like all you guys so much uh so uh from me to everyone watching, thank you so much for, you have so many things you can do on a Friday night and you chose to spend your time with us. Um, if you enjoyed this production, tell all your friends. Uh, this is gonna be live for a week. So you can go ahead and click on this link that you came to to come here to watch it. And you can watch it for the next week. You can send it to your friends. If you're in the industry, point your producer friends towards it. Point your director friends towards it. Point your actor friends towards it. Uh, let people know. So if you loved it, tell everyone you know. If you hated it, tell all your enemies, okay? Let them watch it. Either way, just tell people about it because if you build it, they won't come unless you tell everybody and then they'll come. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Naomi, who wrote this, for trusting us with, with your art and your words and your baby. Thank you for that trust. Naomi and I have never met, so I put a lot of stock into that trust. Thank you very much, and I hope we get to work again in the future. Uh, you can find No Pants Theater at nopantstheater.com. We're, uh, we're, uh, we're on Instagram, at No Pants Theater. Follow us on, on uh, Facebook, join our group, and get involved. If you want to get involved, shoot me an email, nopantstheater at gmail.com. Send me an email if you want to get involved, if you have an idea for a script, if you just want to, there's no sweeping the stages here, okay? So if you want to get involved, let me know. I'd be happy to bring you on. We've got a big thing coming in about a month, but we also have more readings coming down the pipe. Uh, so again, whatever you're doing today, 
after this. I hope you have a great time. I hope you come to our after party. It's going to be fun. And if you have a drink, now's the time to raise that glass because we're about to end this live stream. We're going to end it with a toast. This is to you because without you, 